So well, we're talking about this theme of around the fire. And as we do this, um, we want to, I want to draw your attention to this story that is, it's kind of a unique story in the Bible, in the New Testament we're going to be focused on. And where it's a story of a young, he's called a boy, but he's really a young man, we know from the, the language used, where he is demon possessed and he's being thrown into it says the fire and into water. And we're going to be looking at that story. And so I want to have you um, turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17 in verse 14. That's where we're going to be kind of focusing our time. So far we've seen this imagery of fire used in the context of how God is holy. So God is holy and he, because he's holy and because he loves you and because he loves me, God sent, and when, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God sent this angel with this flaming sword. It's the first time we see this, in, we, see a, we see fire, we see the imagery of fire in the, in the Bible. God sent this angel to keep man from trying to get back into the Garden of Eden. Why? Is it because God doesn't want unholy things to come into his, you know, perfection? No, not at all. God loved Adam and Eve, but they had eaten from the tree that they were not supposed to eat from. And the danger was that they were going to go back into the garden and eat from the tree that God wanted them to eat from. Here's the thing. The tree that God wanted them to eat from was called the tree of life. Had they eaten from that in a sinful state, then they would have lived forever in that sinful state. And God, because he's holy and because he loves us, puts this angel there to keep them from entering. Not because he didn't want them to have access to him, but because they could no longer have access apart from what he was going to do on a cross a couple thousand or several thousand years later. And so this imagery of fire in the Bible so far has been an imagery of God's holiness. Tonight, it's going to turn a little bit. And we're going to see how the, the devil uses the same fire, the thing that God used to protect us from ourselves, the devil wants to use to destroy you. And we're going to look at what that means here in Matthew chapter 17. Um, Matthew 17, beginning in verse 14. When they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him. And he said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Again, just let's just read through the verses again, because I want you to see here. Matthew 17, verse 14. Just really pay attention to this. When they'd come to the multitude, a man came to them kneeling down and he said to them, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he suffers severely for he is often falling into the fire and into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Now the story is this. Jesus is up on the mountaintop with three of his disciples and, and he's transfigured before them, meaning his glory is revealed. The same glory um, of God in heaven is now being revealed through, through Jesus. Peter is overwhelmed with excitement. And he says, let's build, you know, remember Moses shows up and Elijah shows up. And Peter says, let's build tabernacles for all of these awesome people. And then God speaks from heaven and he, come, and he says, this is my beloved son. I want you to listen to him. Have you ever heard the phrase, if you've been a Christian for a long time or you've been around church for a while, you've heard this phrase, a mountaintop experience. And what we're talking about is really it comes from this, this passage where it's like you're up on a mountain and you're experiencing the glory of God. You're experiencing just God's overwhelming glory. Well, the opposite of a mountaintop experience is a valley experience. And David spoke a lot about valleys. Well, there's three disciples on the mountaintop and there's nine of them. I'm good at math. There was 12, three, nine. Okay. Nine of them down in the valley. And while they're down in the valley, something different is happening. They're not having a mountaintop experience. There's a dad who brings his son who the Bible here says he's an epileptic. Okay. And we're going to talk about what that means or why he said that in just a second. But Jesus comes down the mountain and he confronts this kind of this human need. You see, mountaintop experiences are great, but the valley is where everybody's living. It's where we all dwell. It's where the need for God's glory to be revealed is the most. 
So I would say for you and I, we've got to get used to a life where we got to go up and get away and meet God. That's what we're supposed to do here. But most of our lives are going to be spent in valleys where people are. Reaching people, being a part of normal life. So jump with me now, Matthew. Uh, well, no, you don't have to jump anywhere. Verse 17. Look at verse 17 here. Jesus answered and he said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Verse 18. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Now, did you notice that the man came to Jesus and he said, my son has epilepsy, which is very different. And we're going to talk about this a lot tonight. And then Jesus, we read, Jesus says, this kid is demon possessed and I'm going to cast out this demon, which is what he does. And so it raises the question, how are we supposed to know if someone's demon possessed or if it's something else? I mean, the, the dad says, my kid has epilepsy. Now, that's not the full picture of what this dad believed about his son. In fact, I want you to jump over to the uh, Gospel of Luke. Jump to Luke chapter 9. If you don't have it, I'm going to have it here for you. But if you do, do so so you can see it for yourself. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 37. Same story from a doctor. Remember, Luke is a doctor. So when he wrote this, he wrote this from a very kind of analytical medical perspective. Here's what he writes. It happened on the next day when they had come down the mountain that a great multitude met him. Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out saying, teacher, I implore you, look on my son for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him. Did you notice it right there? Here, it's clear that this dad didn't believe that his son just had a medical condition. This dad, and this is so important to understanding this whole issue, this dad was very clearly in the belief that his son was demon-possessed. We'll talk about that in just a moment, but I want you to see that he believed it. And he said this, he suddenly cries out, it convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. Verse 40, so I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. So I want you to see here when Luke tells this story, and it's not that Mark or Matthew, excuse me, Matthew and Mark say the same thing. It's not that they wrote it wrong. It's just that they didn't catch that detail that Luke understood would be so important for the rest of history for all of us to understand. The dad makes it very clear that his son was demon possessed, was possessed of a spirit, and that the spirit was trying to kill his son on a regular basis. So I want to start with the question, and this is, and I'll put it up here. This is the question that I want to deal with. How can we tell what the difference between demon possession and mental illness? And it's a subject that comes up all the time if you've been a Christian longer than a year or even six months or in many cases it's immediate. Is it possible that we could misdiagnose mental illness as demon possession or vice versa? Demon possession as mental illness. And I'd love to tell you that it never happens but the reality is that it happens all the time. In fact, let me tell you a story. When I was in Hungary, um, a few months ago, literally, um, about, about 15 years ago, we had a gal who came to our church who had been born again and been filled with the Holy Spirit. And she was just so excited about the Lord. And she begun to pray in tongues at her church. She went to, um, she went to a different church, like a different altogether. And they, it was a traditional historical church and they didn't believe in that. And they actually had her locked up in a psychiatric ward. Because she was, um, you know, she prayed in tongues. And so they, they had, and so we actually, we actually met her in that site. We had a, one of our gals in our church was a nurse at that hospital. And she said, Phil, you've got to come to the hospital and meet this gal. She's locked up and she should not be here. She's not, there's no problems. She just believes in God. And so we went, and we met her and we talked with her and boy, she just seemed as, I don't want to say as normal as you and me because I don't know about us most of the time. But she seemed, she seemed pretty okay, you know. And, and, and in reality, just that church had decided there's something wrong with this girl. And they had, so I can't tell you how many times, and, and in the world that we're living in today, especially, and, it, and it's so important, we are, on the, um, we are hearing about the issue of mental illness. And I'm thankful for that so much more than we ever were in the past. And we want to do what we can tonight to try to dispel some of these false ideas that exist around that and around the, because as Christians, it's easy for us to say, well, that's got to be such and such demon possession. But in some cases we're, we're incorrect on that. And we want to be clear. What is the difference and how can I tell? 
And here's the good news. By the end of the night, my hope is this. You're not going to be, and you're like, man, I did not come to church to figure this out. This is weird. I promise you it's going to bless you in the end. Here's the reality. Here's the, here's the reality. At the end of tonight, I hope you'll leave with a very clear understanding of what that means. What is demon possession even? Now, some of you might be here and say, I don't even believe in demon possession. We could talk about that whether you do or you don't. The Bible says that there are real demons that live in this world. It's a, we live in a spiritual world. It's pretty hard to argue that. But if you don't believe that, you can still enjoy tonight, I promise. But if you do and you know that it's real and you know that it's true, hopefully this is going to be a help for you. Because at the end, you're going to see, it's not a question of, is it, is it one or the other If someone's demon possessed, you'll know. That's what the Bible tells us. And we'll look at that and we'll make that point really clear. It's important to understand that we live in a world that is spiritual. So when Jesus came down the mountain, and one of the issues that I think is probably the most important in this whole context is that when Jesus came down the mountain, his disciples couldn't do anything. Now, keep in mind, these are the same disciples that Jesus had sent out to do miracles and to preach about him. They went, they went out to the whole world or to the, their whole world, cities around, you know, Jerusalem. And they were telling people, cities around Galilee, we're going out and we're telling people, hey, the Messiah has come. He loves you. He wants to give you a new, a new life. He's, he's gonna, he wants to save you and all these things. And when there were sick people, it says that they healed sick people and they cast out demons. Now, again, I don't know about you, but there's, God's allowed me to have certain experiences, but there's others that I have not had. And I'm thinking, wow, these guys have had some massive experiences of God's power in their lives. They've gone out and they've been used by God to do some pretty incredible things. Well, now, now they've come back. It's a different time. And Jesus is away for really not that long. And this dad brings a kid and says, and by the way, when the Bible says boy, it, honestly, it means like a young man. He was not a little boy. This was a young man. And he brings this young man to the disciples and he says, hey, where's Jesus? Oh, he's not available right now. Can we help you? Yes, my son. And then he recites the whole story. And I imagine they had all this confidence in the world and they had every right to believe that they were going to be able to do something. And so, yeah, bring your, bring your son over to us and we're going to pray for him and God's going to cast out this demon. And they, they do everything that they've done before. By the way, there is no class you can take to learn how to cast out a demon. You know, it's not like you go like, you know, oh, demon possession 101 or, you know, Southwestern doesn't offer this class, okay? There's no, I mean, nobody's done this and they're just like praying and they're like, okay, I mean, God, please help this kid. Please do something right now. Nothing changes. Nothing happens. And so I imagine like, I don't know about you, but I would have a tendency to try to recreate in my mind. What did I do last time? You ever been like that? You know, if like, You said something that was like really good and people were like, wow, that was really good. So you say it like 50 more times and then it starts every time it loses its power, you know. I imagine, you know, maybe they laid their hands on his shoulder and then one of the guys is like, no, not the right hand. It's the left hand on the left shoulder. You know, no, it's on his head. No, it's on his back. You got to put your arm around. You got to side hug, side hug him and pray, you know, and everybody's trying their little hocus pocus to make this this demon go away and nothing works. And what ends up happening is this dad now is in total doubt that, that God's, that, you know, God's alive, that God's real. And then it gets worse than that because the, the, uh, the uh, apostles come down and, uh, or come over, or excuse me, the, the, uh, the Pharisees come over and they're now arguing with the disciples. They're arguing with them like, you guys, you guys don't know what you're talking about. You guys don't know how to do anything. You guys are useless and Jesus is useless and your ministry is useless. And they begin to argue with him. And it's this um, unbelievable thing. And Jesus comes down the mountain. And what I want you to see that is so cool is this. Jesus comes down the mountain. And what Luke shows us, and you can read it again in Luke chapter 9. It's as if, okay, there's the disciples arguing with the Pharisees. And Jesus comes down the mountain and his disciples are like so happy to see him. He walks past them and he gets between Pharisee and disciple. He comes right into there and he says, what's the problem? In other words, he really, right away, he stands up for his guys. Had they been ineffectual? Totally. (laughs) 
They should have been and done better than they did, but they didn't. But Jesus doesn't like look at them and say, you guys are losers. No, he stands in between there and he goes right after the, uh, the Pharisees and says, what's the problem? And the Pharisees tell him, your disciples can't do anything. They're useless. Look at your ministry. What's the point? And Jesus is immediately, before he fixes this other family's you know, issue, the first thing that Jesus does is that he comes in between that outward religion that is going to put everybody else down. Because you see, here's the thing. The disciples tried to do something, right? And they failed. What did the Pharisees do? Nothing. They didn't even try to help. And there's always those that want to stand on the outside and criticize everybody else who's trying to do something that, to help. And I don't know about you guys, but I think I can speak for all of us when I say, we don't want to be those people. We don't want to people that, that be the people that stand on the side and criticize everybody else who's trying to do something that's good. They're trying to do something that could help. They're trying to do something in the name of Jesus. And you might look at it and say, gosh, there's a better way. Okay, but you're not doing anything, so you can't criticize the one that is doing something. And I, and I think of this, and I, and I wrote this down. There's a couple takeaways that I want you to consider. Um, here it is. Yeah, how can we tell the difference between... Da, 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 da. Here's the takeaways that I had. Get involved with those who are hurting and don't stand on the side and criticize those who are trying. Get involved with those who are hurting and don't stand on the side and criticize those who are actually trying. The longer we live, the easier it is to feel like, I know whatever I do won't be enough. If you've been a Christian for a while, when you first got saved, you're like, man, we're going to change the world. And then you've been around a while and you're like, man, I just want to get out of the world. And the thing is, is that both are correct. But we end up thinking, oh, it's more important that we get out of this world. That's not true. What's most important is that we do the will of God. <laughs> so we're here now and we're meant to do as much as we can to help people who are hurting. Even though the disciples failed to do any serious help, they tried. And they were still growing. And instead of Jesus criticizing them, he actually, you know, he stood by them. Which I absolutely appreciate so much. So... Later, if you're in Matthew chapter 17, I'm not going to put it here, up here, but in Matthew chapter 17, later, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, Lord, why couldn't we do anything? And at that moment, Jesus kind of criticizes them a little bit. He says, you're faithless. This kind can only come out through prayer and fasting. Which is a funny thing to say, because how do you do that? I mean, uh, they bring a guy, you know, this dad brings his son up to them and says, can you help? Can Jesus help me? Jesus isn't here, but we can help you. What's the need? My son's demon possessed. Can you help him? Yeah. And then they try in Jesus' name. They do everything they could that they knew to do and nothing works. Jesus comes down the mountain and he's got their back. He protects them. But when they privately say, Lord, why couldn't we do anything? His answer is, you got to pray and you got to fast. The praying is the easy part. It's hard to fast when they're, they're right there. You know, it's like, you know, don't eat a hot dog tonight. And then after, you know, it's as if they come to you and they say, you know, can you help me? It's like, well, let me skip a meal and I'll be back. What does this look like exactly? And what Jesus was saying was not, this is the method for power. What he's saying is that you and I need to have a life of regular dependency upon him. And fasting is a part of that. Now, who in here likes food? I know you do. You're at Calvary San Diego. You love food. Raise your hand. Don't lie. Okay. Because we, that's all we eat. We're like, we're real disciples. Jesus was always making food, so it's good. So, fasting. What's Jesus talking about? When he says, this kind can only come out through prayer and fasting, what he's saying is this. When you fast, you're saying, Lord, I'm going to give this time that I would normally give to sustaining my life with temporary things, I'm going to give it over to trusting you to sustain me with eternal things. And it might be that you fast one meal. It might be you fast for a day. You know, you're super spiritual, but you're not if you tell all of us how long you fast. You lose all that right away. So, but some people, you know, I mean, we had a whole crew of guys in Hungary that were fasting for like 30 days the first beginning of the year. Just, I mean, I can say it over here because there's, they're not getting, you know, but these guys were just warriors for God. They just committed the first month of the year to just crying out to God. The kind of ministry and the power that we saw God doing, I, I relate a lot of that to men and women who said, we're going to pray and we're going to fast. It's not the act of just missing food. It's saying, I'm going to trust God. Man shall not live by bread alone. 
I'm going to trust God for something more. I'm going to believe God. for So, so the point that Jesus was, was making was not, you got to miss a meal and then you'll have power. Because I don't know about you, but when I miss a meal, I don't feel more powerful. That's not what he was saying. What he was saying is this, you need to be regularly depending upon me in prayer and in fasting. Anybody here have a family member that needs Jesus? Friend, coworker? I'm thinking about our whole region. I think it's high time that we begin to desperately cry out to God. There needs to be fasting. There needs to be prayer. If we really want to see a breakthrough, which is what I'm believing God wants to do, we got we to gotta get into it. And it's not just by, you know, church attendance or any of these things. It's, it's going to happen when we get on our knees and we pray and we fast. So we want to see breakthrough in our families. We want to see breakthrough in our lives. I know I, I got family members that need Jesus, but I got to be honest, I'm needing Jesus. And so maybe you and I need to make this commitment of saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set time aside to really seek God, to cry out to God. God wants to use our lives. More than ever, we need this today. Okay, let me get back on track because I'm, I'm getting off a little bit. We've established that this young man showed, what is interesting is that, that in, but from two different gospel accounts, we see that this young man showed signs of both one that could have just been mental illness, or on the other hand, Jesus and this dad believed that it was demon possession. So we have to know that this young man was demon possessed. And yet, so much of what he was showing were things that are very, uh, I have a young, uh, one of our young missionaries, well, I guess he's not that young anymore, he's younger than me, so he's young, but uh, one of our missionaries who's serving in the Middle East, an amazing young man, um, it's from the northeast of America, but he's, I, him and I have been together since he was 18, he's probably 30 now, but he, you know, fluent in Russian, fluent in Ukrainian, God called them to the Middle East, he's now preaching in Arabic, and um, they adopted a young boy from Kyrgyzstan, uh, and uh, this young boy was born with severe uh, mental illness, and sadly, he just was diagnosed, he began to have seizures, and he was diagnosed with epilepsy. Now, is, is he demon possessed? Of course not. Of course he's not. And so, th though he was showing symptoms and signs of, of, a, of a mental illness, this young man in the story, he was clearly demon possessed because Jesus tells us that and the, and the dad knew that he was demon possessed. And this raises the question though that I want to talk about and I want to give a couple minutes to this and that is the issue of mental illness. If somebody breaks their leg, we Christians have no problem praying for them. But somebody comes in and says they're dealing with anxiety or depression or other mental issues. The church has been slower to accept that as a real problem. And here's why. Because you're not dealing with it. So when you're not dealing with it, it's easy to say, hey, just read your Bible and pray more and you'll be good. Because that's what I do and I'm good. The problem is, is that like, you know, you also don't have the broken leg. <laughs> But you can understand it and you can sympathize with it. The, uh, there's a, the biggest organization that deals with, in, in America for this, is the National Alliance of Mental Illness. And they put out some great, I mean, some unbelievable reports. I'm going to show you some of them here. These are facts, and this is from just last year. 43.8 million adults experience mental illness in a given year. If you can't see it from far away, the green dude, you know, this represents America. One in five Americans right now are, are struggling with mental illness. Okay. Nearly one in 25, this is 10 million adults in America are living with a serious mental illness. And one half of all chronic mental illness begins by the age of 14, three quarters by the age of 24. Okay. I'll keep going. The prevalence they say is this, one in 100 American adults live with schizophrenia. 2.6, that's, that's 6 million adults live with bipolar disease. 16 million of American adults live with a major depression and 42 million adults are dealing with anxiety disorders. And I know somebody in here is going to say that number has grown so much in recent times and the medication and all. Listen to this. Guess what? The baby boomer numbers from the, from the, from the 30s, they've been tracking this. Identical. Hasn't changed. We are not dealing with an increase of, but what we are dealing with is an increase in awareness. Not an increase in the numbers, but an increase in awareness. They put this thing out, this, the consequences. Approximately 10 million adults have co-occurring mental health and addiction disorders. What that means is if you're dealing with a mental health issue, your odds of dealing with a drug addiction are exponentially higher. 
Okay, 26% of homeless adults staying in shelters live with serious mental illness. 24% of, the, of state prisoners have a recent history of mental health condition. The impact, here's where they put the impact. Depression is now the leading cause of disability worldwide. The cost in America every year, not the cost of medication and whatnot, but the issue of mental illness costs America $193 billion every year. Okay? And finally, 90% of those who die by suicide have an underlying mental illness. It is now the 10th leading cause of death in America. One more to put up. Treatment. 60% of adults with mental illness do not receive treatment. 50% aged 8 to 15 do not receive mental health. And this may be, you might be interested in this. African American and Hispanic Americans use mental health services about one half the rates of whites. And Asian Americans at about one third the rate. The problem, the, the, the reality is this, guys. We live in a, in a society, and by the way, they, they focus on America. I've done the same thing in, in uh, Hungary and in Europe. And the numbers track the same. They're different numbers, but the percentages are almost the same. We're dealing, we're at a time when people are seriously dealing with major issues. It's not just a physical issue. It's a mental one as well. And we, come, we become somewhat polarized when we talk about mental illness. When it comes to the subject of medication, um, you know, is it okay for somebody to be on this? Do we believe in this? Is it right? Is it wrong? We're dealing with all these issues all the time. It's super confusing. And um, in this situation, what I think is important in the story that we're re reading in the Bible, it's important that this young man was dealing with what seemed to be mental illness, but it was not. It was demon possession. Now, how can we differentiate between the two? When you're, you know, I mean, again, um, we just came from living in an inner city where you walk down the street, you get on a metro or a tram or subway, whatever, whatever it's, I don't know what they're called here. Um, you know, it, you cannot walk down the street without bumping into people who are either homeless or are dealing with severe mental illness, talking to themselves, medicating themselves just to try to survive. And you walk down the street at 11 at night and you're like, Am I being, is this, is this demon possession? Is this mental? What's going on? You know, in some parts of America, we can hide or avoid those, you know, those things. But when you live in an inner city, you can't. It's just in your face at all time. In, um, you know, we, we look at people who are dealing with epilepsy. We look at people who are dealing with Tourette's syndrome. I got to tell you, when I was a high school pastor, I was brand new in ministry. And we had a young girl. You guys know like Tourette's syndrome where it's the inability to control some of your muscles and even sometimes what you say. And I had this sweet, sweet girl in our youth group. When I was, I was a youth pastor, I was 22 years old, 21 years old. That, Chuck Smith was the, was the dummy that let me do that at that age, okay? If you're wondering who was the dumb pastor, it was Chuck. So, uh, And I remember we had this girl in our youth group and she had severe Tourette syndrome. And at the time, we just didn't really know what that was. But she'd, she'd come and she'd say this, um, I might shout out a little bit during your Bible study. And I'm like, that's cool, Pentecostal. She goes, no, not that kind. It's not cool, you know. It's not going to be good. I, I'm on medication, but I'm not, I'm, they're working on it. And this poor girl, I don't know about you, but I was listening to her. And we, I mean, she was with me for four years. We loved her. She's an amazing gal. Everything that was in her mind, she would say out loud. If she watched a movie the night before, we all heard it. How would you do as a Christian if everybody knew what was in your mind? <laughs> Epic fail, right? You know, if we knew what you were thinking at all times. I remember one, this one time we were, um, we were at a retreat for uh, like our young leaders in the high school group and she was an awesome girl and, and the, the guy teaching and he's a wonderful man and he knew, he knew her situation so he had so much love for her, you know, but he's, he's teaching and he just mentioned, he just, I mean briefly, he just mentioned hell, just said the word and that just triggered something in her mind. And so she's, hell, fire, burning, fire. I mean, all the kids are getting freaked out. You know, we're all like getting nervous. You know? And he's like, oh my gosh, bunnies, flowers, happy, rainbow, love. You know? <laughs> just triggered something else in her mind, you know. And it just shifted something in her head and she was okay. She goes, thank you, I'm so sorry. No, no, you don't have to apologize. It's no problem. You know, nobody knew how to handle those things. And I'd stay in the world we're in today. People are still wrestling with those things. And they're talking about how many kids are going to school and getting picked on because they're a little different. You know, it's a big popular subject today and we don't know what to do and we don't know how to handle this. 
When, when is something de demon possession and when is something just a chronic mental illness? And it's easy to say, but, you know, and, a, and I think the number one that we saw on the screen here was that depression is the one that's ruining so many people. And it's so easy to, if you're not dealing with it, it's so easy to say, just pray more, you know, worship God more. Just believe God. And it, depression must exist because you don't trust God. But the reality is, do you know how many amazing Christians, books from them you've read? You've listened to their music. You've heard about them all the time. People, Charles Spurgeon, maybe the most famous of them all, the greatest preacher, they say, of all time. Charles Spurgeon dealt with debilitating depression his entire life. Every year he had such chronic pain that it took him into a terrible depression. He had to leave his pulpit for an extended time just to, just to be able to get over it. Hudson Taylor, one of my favorite people of all time, missionary to China. Hudson Taylor, later years of his ministry, dealt with, he dealt with the kind of depression that actually led him to suicidal thoughts. This is the man that literally would open up China to the entire world. This guy is celebrated in every language as one of the greatest missionaries of all time. And then you find out the guy wanted to kill himself at one point in his life. And it wasn't just a thought that he had, but this was, an, this was a strong for weeks and months and years he was fighting this issue. He was laid up in bed. And again, this is where you see physical illness and mental issues quite often work hand in hand. They loved God so much but they suffered so much. And so many people today, had so many people in our church in Budapest, and I guarantee you we, were, we have people in our church here that are feeling like second-class Christians because they're dealing with anxiety. And it's like, why can't I be happy like everybody else? Well, guess what? God loves unhappy people too. God loves people who are depressed. And you might be able to say, and I might be able to say, well, come on, don't be so depressed. You know, smile. I don't want to smile. No, just smile. God loves you. Listen, whatever they're, where they're at, it's okay. God's okay with where each one of us are at. That's the cool thing about, about Jesus. He's okay with where you are at. Now, do I believe that God wants to heal people? 100%. But, you know, I, I think I mentioned many, many, many weeks ago, I mentioned that we had a guy in our church who was blind. Did I mention to him he was our, he, he became our worship leader for a time. He played the guitar like, like Jorge, you know. Good. That meant good, okay. <laughs> He's like, oh, I play like a, okay, no. He, he played really good. He had incredible abilities, you know. And when we would have Bible reading, I would ask him to read it because he could read as fast as the rest of us. Hands moving on the braille, like as quick as everybody's reading, you know, on, on paper. And, and I think, did God want to heal him? Sure, but he didn't heal him. And it was okay, because it's okay to be blind and to love Jesus, right? It's okay. And so now today, we have many people who are also dealing with the issue of depression and anxiety. And the point isn't that we just need to, you know, but it's just, it's, if it's not your issue, we got to let other people have the issues that they're dealing with and let them be okay and let that be okay. If, if it's not your problem, you don't have to try to fix everybody else. You can pray with them. You can love them. Um, one of our, he's, he's actually helping us out in this church, but he's a pastor of a church in Orange County, Dave Rolfe, one of my close, close friends. You know, Dave grew up in a home. He's a pastor of a church up there. He grew up in a home of mental illness. His, 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 uh, he, he taught himself to read at three years old and because his, his mom required him to read the Bible and he read the entire Bible to his mom by the, but before he was four. And, but he, and, and he has such a heart for people who are dealing with serious mental illness. And the thing that he taught me, one of the lessons that he taught me when I served under him was this. He said, you have to understand that people that are dealing with a mental illness are some of the most intense, serious Christians you are ever going to experience in your life. They take the Bible literally. They, when they read, you know, I mean, he, he had a guy who came into his office one day and he says, I'm going to pluck my eye out. Why? What are you talking about? Pluck your eye out. Gonna, the Bible tells me that if your eye sins, you should pluck your eye out. Don't do that. But he wasn't okay in his head. And so he thought, I'm going to do, and he loved God so much, he wanted to take the Bible that literally. So let's be, God bless you, let's be clear that people are wrestling and dealing with major issues in life, but it doesn't mean they're a second-class Christian. We don't want anybody to feel like they're less than. So 
back to our first question, how can we tell the difference between someone who is demon possessed and someone who is just sick? Someone who is wrestling with an issue. Look at Mark chapter 6 verse 13. Mark chapter 6 verse 13 tells us something that's so important. It says this, they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. The Bible does not say people who are sick are also demon possessed. It says there was people who, ha I didn't do that, but whatever. People who were demon possessed and people who were sick. Do you understand? People, Mark 6, 13, write it down, remember it. There were people who were demon possessed and people who were sick. They don't go together. Not always, not necessarily. Do you understand? I want you to see that real clear. Look with me if you would. And, and, and uh, it's okay, I only have two more, so I'll just skip it. Thanks, Devin, he's awesome. I only have a couple more, so you guys can do this on your own because you're super smart. First John 4, 4. Jump there, First John 4, 4, if you don't mind. I'll read it if you're not there. But here it is, 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and you've overcome because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Demonic possession, and this is so important. The Bible tells us something so clear about demonic possession. Here it is, are you ready? Demonic possession is about control. It's when a spirit comes and takes control. And so here's, here's what I want to tell you tonight. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you cannot be possessed. The Bible is very clear on this point. Now, some of you are saying, wait a minute, I feel like the devil's after me all the time. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's different. But you cannot be, you, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Who's in you? Christ is in you. If you've been born again, then God is, is dwelling in your life now. Who is it that's in the world? That's the devil. The devil is in the world today. So greater is he who is in you, which is Jesus, than he who is in the world. You cannot be, you will not be controlled by another spiritual force. If you're a Christian, you don't have to worry about that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7 says this. Paul said this, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, listen, a messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I be exalted above measure. Paul got sick. And if you don't know this about Paul, and we'll look at it when we get into his, some of his epistles, Paul had terrible eyesight. He was afflicted, and the Bible tells us that he was afflicted by Satan, but it was a physical illness. And we know that he, he couldn't see after a while. He was, and, and, and there was times when he would write and he would say, see with what big letters I'm writing to you. He had a hard time seeing the, the pages now. And he was laid up and he was pushed down real hard for a long time. And he says, three times I prayed to God, God, please take this from me. And God said to him, my grace is enough for you. In other words, I'm okay with the fact that you're not able to see well. I'm okay with the fact that your eyes are hurting. I'm okay with the fact that this is holding you back a little bit. I'm going to do things in your life that you couldn't do if you were just totally healthy. I'm going to use your illness for my glory. And is the devil coming after you? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I'm going to get more glory through this. Here's the reality. The devil wants to destroy your life. The devil wants to ruin your life. And we're going to look at that in just a second. But he cannot take control of your life. If you've given your life over to Jesus. Can the devil influence you? Oh yeah. Can the devil oppress you? Come after you? Ruin circumstances around you? Listen, if you don't believe that that's possible, you need to have a conversation with Job. Because that dude got beat up. So read the book of Job. If you're like, no, the devil can't have any power over my life. Read Job. But what the devil can't do is take control of you. You see, the devil allowed Paul to be in prison. The devil allowed Paul to suffer physically. The devil allowed Paul. The devil did a lot to Paul. But what the devil could not do was control who Paul was. Paul was free. Paul was forgiven. Paul was a warrior for God's purposes. And no physical and no mental, no emotional, nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Can you get knocked down? Absolutely. But the Bible says the righteous just keep getting up. Can the devil hurt you? Sure he can. But he cannot control you. Let me read to you again from Matthew 17 verse 15. Lord, have mercy on my son 
for he is epileptic and he suffers severely for he often falls into, here it is, there it is. You can see it there, the fire and often into the wire. When it says that he falls into the fire, it doesn't mean that he's like walking along and then all of a sudden, oh no. It means literally that he, this spirit throws him into the fire. In other words, this poor young man who was demon possessed was in a situation where if he was near water, near fire, near anything that could kill him, the devil was trying to destroy him. Whatever was possessing him was trying to destroy his life. John 10 verse 10, and I'm going to finish with this verse. And we'll talk about this for just a moment. The thief, John 10, 10 is one of the, oh my gosh, if you, if you don't have this one memorized, please memorize this one. If you don't have it underlined, underline it. Even if you're on a tablet, you can underline stuff. Highlight it. Remember it. John 10, 10 is one of the, oh, it's just beautiful. Here it is. Jesus is speaking and here's what he says. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it in abundance. And Jesus is the one speaking here. The fire of God's holiness was meant to keep you from suffering for the rest of eternity. But here in our story, fire was used to try to destroy a young man, to try to ruin his life, to try to kill him. The devil wants to destroy you. Let, let, let me say this. This is so important. It applies to young, it applies to old, it applies to all. Suicide is demonic. It's just demonic. Now, now, am I saying that the, the feeling depressed or feeling discouraged or feeling suicidal is just demonic? No, no. What I'm saying is this. The devil wants you to end your life. The devil wants you to believe that your life is not important. The devil wants you to believe that you're just another number. You're just another stat. You're, ju you're, you're just one of seven billion and you don't matter and nobody will miss you and nobody will care about you. And there's, there's, not, there's literally not anything that it could be a bigger lie than that truth. When Jesus comes and says, I have come so you can have abundant life. What does abundant life mean? It means this. Jesus did not come just to save you for heaven. He came to bring heaven into your life right now. Jesus came to give you a full life today. Now, does that mean that if you become a Christian, everything is hunky-dory? I love saying hunky-dory. I never get to use that enough. Does it mean everything? No, no, not at all. Of course not. And I know you know that already. But the devil wants you to believe God is not for you, that your life does not matter, and you'd be better off ending your life. And, and nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. And we're living at a time when rich, poor, famous, unfamous, whatever, people are taking their lives in unprecedented levels. Why? The devil's convincing everybody it, that would be better. But it, it won't be. And it isn't. God wants to use you. God wants to save you. God wants to fill you. Listen, can Christians kill themselves? Christians kill themselves all the time. It's tragic. But if you're really a Christian, if you're really a Christian, you can still suffer from this. The reality is this, do not give in to the lies of the enemy who says your life doesn't matter. Because if you're hearing that, listen, here's the reality. If you're hearing that tonight or tomorrow or the next day, or if you've heard that, be, if you've heard this lie in your head that says my life doesn't matter, then let me tell you, your life must really matter. If somebody's lying to you enough now in your head, if somebody's in there telling you you're nothing and you're nobody and convincing you of that truth, then you really matter. God wants to do something in your life and the devil knows it. He's going to try to ruin you. Don't, let, by the way, if you haven't heard that, don't think that you're not important either. <laughs> the reality is this. You matter to God. He came to give you life. The devil wants to destroy you. In our picture tonight, fire was used by the enemy not to promote holiness, not to promote God's protection, but to destroy a person's life. God doesn't want your life destroyed. God wants you saved. God wants you healed. God wants you whole. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And Lord, I think of this passage. I think of this young man who was healed by Jesus. And Lord, I'm so thankful that in the Bible, 
when someone was possessed, when someone was truly dealing with just a, it was a spiritual issue that manifested in physical ways, there was never any doubt. There was never people wondering, is it just a mental thing? Is it just a physical? No, people knew, everyone knew this is demonic. And we see in your word in Mark 16 that there were times when something was demonic and there were other times when it was clearly just a physical issue. And so, Lord, I have full confidence that as we are living our lives, you are the one who gives such clarity when something is demonic and when something is just physical or mental or emotional. And I believe, God, that you can, you just give perfect clarity in those situations. And so, God, help us to be in the spirit, able to differentiate what is clearly separate, that we would be able to be used by you when it's, when it's something that is spiritual, that we would be used by you to bring healing. And when it is something that is mental or physical or emotional, that we would also be there to bring healing and to bring help. Lord, we pray as we know that, and all of us know people who are wrestling with just debilitating depression and anxiety and issues that so many people uh, have been made to feel like they're not a good Christian because of it. Lord, please help us to love those that are hurting tonight. Help us to love those that are hurting today. Help us to find ways, Lord, to show your mercy and your grace. Lord, we believe, I, be I know the devil's real and I know he's out there to destroy lives, to destroy my life, to destroy my family, to destroy this church, to destroy each one of our lives. He wants to ruin us for the purposes that you have for us. And God, we want to stand against the wells of the enemy. We want to stand firm against the, the fiery darts that he wants to throw at us. We want to stand firm believing that you want to use our lives to bring healing and wholeness to other people's lives. Bless your people and give us the strength, God, and the courage to stand up for those that are hurting. We don't want to stand on the sides and critique. We want to jump into, into those that are hurting. Use us, Lord, and use, use us, Lord, to bring healing, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching us today here at Calvary San Diego. We're so glad you took the time to be with us in our service. We'd like to encourage you that if you would like to see more of our studies, you can do so at our website. And we also want to give you the opportunity there to give if it would be in your heart to do so. You can do that at our website, calvarysd.com giving. We'd love for you to partner with what God's doing here in San Diego. God bless you guys.